filming, right? Yes, we are recording. Okay. Welcome, so, everybody. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> my name's John. Uh, this is my friend, David Gosley. Um, David, would you like to say a few opening words about how we decided on this book? Yeah, uh, I found yeah. I found John's uh, YouTube channel. I enjoyed uh, your, criti- uh, your reviews and criticism. And uh, we started talking in the comment sections first. And... Uh, Then we considered the idea of reading a book together slowly. Since we are both busy, we are reading one chapter at a time. So if any of the viewers likes to join us, it will be very easy to just jump in and read a chapter, sample a chapter. Um, And so, yeah, it sounds like a very, go ahead. I'm going to leave a message underneath the the drop-down box, um, Mm -hmm. inviting other people to, if, if they're curious about this talk, or maybe future ones that we have to express interest to either you or me and let us know. And then maybe they can take part in future ones uh, as they wish. Sounds good. Sounds good. The book that we decided on was, and let's see if this, is that, there we go. It's Hayden White. Uh, Hayden White was um, a, a literary critic, I guess you could call him, but he had um, a he was interested in a lot of different questions that reached beyond literature, um, especially into history, um, history, the study of genres uh, and stuff like that. And this book is a set of essays. We are discussing on uh, perhaps how to uh, pronounce that first word. I don't Perfect. know if we, <laughs> we made a final, final decision. Um, it could be tropics, <laughs> but it also could be tropics. I'm um, convinced that it is tropics. tropics. Yeah. Are you convinced? Okay. Yeah. We can go with that. So this is tropics of discourse, mm-hmm. essays on cultural criticism, essays in cultural criticism. It has an introductory essay, which is what we'll be talking about today, uh, followed up by, I think, 12 essays, which sort of tie into the ideas in the introductory essay. Mm-hmm. And all we're going to be talking about today is the introduction, because there's a lot to sort of chew on there. And it's, it's plenty to talk about. Uh, and we'll give context for, you know, however many of these we want to do. Yeah. So um, maybe some vocabulary to start out yeah. with. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a very sort of idiosyncratic way of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not so idiosyncratic when you talk about literary criticism generally, because a lot of it is like this. <laughs> But he's, he's very much um, in love with his um, words from the history of rhetoric. Um, he borrows a lot from uh, some philosophical vocabulary. Um, and he's, he's not the easiest writer to understand uh, for, for people who haven't really delved into theory. Mm. But uh, David and I, I think, want to sort of make this more approachable um, because I, I don't think it has to be as hard as the way he's writing it. Right. Um, yeah. So um, what, what would you like to say about maybe some important words, big, big words that re- uh, reoccur yeah. over? Again? First, I, I just like to uh, maybe read together this first sentence, the first two sentences of the chapter, which I found quite beautiful. And then we will get to the first keyword or the central word of the of the introductory chapter, which is discourse, and what it what it is, and then the soul of discourse. So, if you don't mind, I'll read the first uh, two sentences. When we seek to make sense of such problematical topics as human nature, culture, society, and history, we never say precisely what we wish to say or mean precisely what we say. So, we never say what we precisely wish to say, and we never mean what we what we say, what we are precisely saying. Our discourse always tends to slip away from our data towards the structures of our, uh, of of consciousness with which we are trying to grasp them. So this is almost like how Kant begins uh, the first critique. Uh, And he'll he'll come back to that very, very end, right? right? And that whole structures of consciousness is exactly what clued me into, he might be some sort of a Kantian here. And Lo and behold, at the very end, he says it himself. And we'll go on, we'll go into what makes him a Kantian later, in case you're not familiar with Kant. Hmm. Um, 
discourse, discourse. to build on that. Mm -hmm. um, discourse, uh, he defines it as the verbal operation by which the questing consciousness situates its own efforts to bring a problematical domain of experience under cognitive control. Mm. So basically, um, you can see how he writes. He loves the sound of his own voice. Uh, he's talking about a conversation. He's talking about a conversation about a topic. So when we talk about history, we're having a discourse. We're having a conversation. We're having some sort of back and forth, a give and take. Um, he doesn't like the word dialectic, but we, we could say it is some sort of a dialectical process, right? right. And he... He offers uh, another, another alt, an alt, uh, alternative to dialectic, which is dietactic. So a tactic at, or taxis is a movement. So moving from one place to another. And yes. di dietaxis, I think he wants to suggest that it's movement in time. You go from your, the structure of your consciousness to the subject at hand, the subject matter, and then you go back, back and forth because of that slipping away of the, sub, uh, of the object. He says he doesn't like the word dialectical because dialectic often refers to something transcendent. Mm. Again, there's that Kantian strain again. But um, there's, there's nothing really obviously transcendent when we're talking about human conversations, right? Whether it be about history or anything else. So that move from dialectical to didactical was, again, just another expression of his love for rhetorical terms, I think, mm. and kind of unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think dialectical would, would have been fine, but I understand where he's coming from. So discourse is basically a conversation between at least two people on um, undergoing the process of understanding, uh, trying to approach some sort of understanding on a subject. It might be useful. He contrasts discourse with two other things. He says discourse is neither uh, just a logical demonstration, nor fiction. So what is uh, characteristic of both, well, in, in logical demonstration, language it can afford to just refer to itself. So deduce based on what is already within statements, just preserve the truth of statements without having to refer to something beyond language, uh, something in the world, an event in the world or a fact in the world. Uh, and fiction also, whatever fiction refers to doesn't have to be faithful to the to events in the world it can just be products of language but this course cannot afford that this course always has that uh dia, dia, dia tactic or dialectic relationship with something and that is the, the root of its difficulty fiction can be a complete fabrication right it, it, it's not tied to anything of the external world it can be a complete artifice. Mm. Um, fact uh, is something that I think Hayden White would question that we have any access to whatsoever. We really have no access to raw facts. Again, that's Kant. We'll talk about that later. So then what, what, is, what is discourse? Discourse is a mapping, a series of mappings from those raw facts, which we claim to have some sort of access to, to our attempt of uh, creating some sort of understanding. And how we do that is through the imposition of tropes. Right, right. Which is why he says tropes or troping is the soul of discourse. Yes. So there as would opposed be no to the, without the other, there would be no discourse without tropes. Right. Well, the soul as opposed to the body, the discourse will have just a dead body without the <laughs> yes. without tropes. That's Descartes. We don't need to go into Descartes and Kant. <laughs> right. But yes. Yes. So um, so these tropes are he is particularly concerned with four. And he sort of refers to these, I think, as master tropes. Mm -hmm. Um the, the four tropes are metaphor. Um, metonymy, synecdoche, and irony. I think everyone probably knows what uh, metaphor and irony are. Um, uh, synecdoche and uh, metonymy, I always get confused. Um, but 
I mean, you can look them up in a dictionary. Um, I always have to, <laughs> but they're, they're, they basically have to refer to um, uh, calling something by its part or by its whole or, or, or something. They're very related, but um, I always have to uh, look them up myself. So he's saying that these are four um, ways that we can take raw pieces of data, raw facts, and try to um, understand them. Would you agree that uh, what is common in all these four, would you agree that they all are ways of grasping something that is beyond our grasp initially? Like yes. me metaphor, metonymy, irony, they're all things, they're, they're ways of grasping something. Like metonymy is grasping something by one of its parts. Uh, synecdoche is, um, or no, it's a switching. Met metonymy, as I, as you said, I, I switched between them. And metonymy is a way of switching something else that is adjacent. Met synecdoche is a way of grasping something by its part. And irony is a, a way of being in relationship with, with it through that distance. Uh, and metaphor is basically a kind of using something else that we are familiar with in order to grasp the thing that we are unfamiliar with. So these are all uh, ways of grasping, which is uh, which enables discourse. And and to go back to those first two sentences that you read, I want to quote the exact language that he uses. Uh, he talks about structures of consciousness, mm -hmm. structures of consciousness. Uh, I think what he's almost saying is that human understanding can't can't really occur without these four things. I mean, th this is how these four things and, you know, other rhetorical tropes too, but these four things are four of the major ways that our mind uh, slowly goes from no understanding to understanding. Right. right. And, and that, that travel, again, that, that sort of slow path from one to the other, not understanding to understanding is the process of a discourse. Mm. We, we, we impose these things. These are the tools that we have to sort of um, make our way through the world mm -hmm. when we ask ourselves questions and understand, attempt to understand answers to those questions. Mm. So when somebody, for example, calls something a hard fact or a fact that, that doesn't care about my feeling, uh, a hard, the hardness of that fact is itself a metaphor. Like you're comparing, you, comparing metaphor to a hard rock that doesn't, uh, budge doesn't uh, is not sensitive to has no sensation or sensitivity or responsiveness to my feelings that itself that statement is a it's a product of a, a metaphor and it is serving a kind of human function it, it, it has, serves an ideological function too right right because by using the word hard you are imbuing the adjectives of strength um something you can't fight with something that doesn't back down Mm -hmm. something that is always true as opposed to soft, which is something that sways, something that oscillates, something that's easy to destroy, right? Yeah, something so you, just, you can but, negotiate with maybe. But, but by the choice of adjectives, have we em employed a trope mm -hmm. which starts to do battle mm -hmm. with the way that we come to understand or not understand something? The way I was thinking about it, um, was the, the famous uh, Civil War photographers of the American Civil War. Um, and this, this might be a, an overly simplified example, but you look at a lot of those photographs and they are understandably gory, um, full of death and blood and destruction. And then there are others that are oddly... Um, peaceful, right? Just a, a, a battlefield um, after it's been cleared. And I was thinking about a trope might be the choice of where the photographer sits or stands when he chooses to or she chooses to take a photograph. Mm -hmm. Because from this valley, you might see certain things that you wouldn't see from the top of this hill or from this position over here. And someone could get two very different pictures of what was going on in a battle or uh, the kind of carnage that had been 
that it passed when you take two different pictures. That might be another example. That's Um, a great example. I don't know which of of the four that would be. That might be a completely different one. But um, that was the one that was always sort of going through my head when I was reading Mm. that. But what it does is, that's a great example because it shows how the tropes that we use the tropes themselves don't become the up the focus of our attention. The trope trope always hides in the background and presents the objects. The trope of the metaphor of a hard rock as a the fact being a hard rock that presents the 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 statements about the fact and itself hides in the background, which is why we we are required. I mean, it, it takes efforts to to go back and analyze the, the tropes and uncover them. The location of the photographer also the photographer. And, and her or his location is, is hiding in the background. You have to like notice it and notice its role. Otherwise, what is presented to us, what is presented is the, the scene. And I would get so, go so far as to say that the more invisible a trope is, the more successful it is. Because if, if you really want to lose an argument or lose a point in an argument, you draw attention to the fact of how artificial your point is, mm-hmm. right? You, mm-hmm. you want to make that point seem natural. Mm-hmm. You want to make it seem like it's completely obvious. And the more you can hide the trope, the more you can easily fit it into the discourse of that narrative that makes it seem natural, easy, simple, undeniable. And maybe that's one of the reasons why you didn't have Matthew Brady, you know, the the famous Civil War photographer, standing in front of his camera doing this when he was taking pictures, you know, because (laughs) that's only a, you know, a late 20th century thing, right? Mm -hmm. You you want to hide the photographer. Mm -hmm. The whole point is to not show the person making the decisions, to show the, you know, reality, how how they want to show it to us. But... um, to not have the, the person making the decisions in front of the camera, but to just have the, the battle scene there. Mm-hmm. Great. So I, I think we covered the, the central theme of this introduction. Now, uh, he, he, I assume he will be applying this idea to the study of history, how the study of history is not as objective as many readers or many historians might claim to be, that the, the use of tropes, the, the place of discourse, persists throughout uh, our doing and studying of history. But remaining with this chapter, there are maybe a few other things we can address, um, a few names that he, he drops, not references, that he makes references to a, a, few, a couple of psychologists, namely Jean Piaget. You would go to the psychologist, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be- because I think he... By the weirdness, by the strangeness of these references, I think he makes it in some ways more clear. He made, he made, he made it clear what he's doing because you have to make the connection. You have to put some effort to make the connection yourself. Uh, it's like, what is the different? What is the connection between tropes, Piaget, Freud, and then the, his examples from history? So maybe we can say a few things about the inclusion of Piaget. Uh, what is for me significant in that connection is that he wants to say that this course is not something we only do in our scholarly activities. This course and these four tropes uh, are features of our conscious activities. And anytime our awareness, our human consciousness is attempting to gain an understanding of something in that process, these, uh, these four ways are applied. We apply these four ways. And those yes. show, show up in different stages of human development, the development of human mind. It's almost, it's exactly, it's not something that happens when you open up a textbook. It's, it's always going on. When, when you don't understand how, you know, um, something works, anything works, you are, first of all, trying to think about it in terms of how things you know work. That's a metaphor, for example. You know, so so that's sort of like the first step, and then you you progress through the other steps. But it's not it's not just history. It's not, and this is one of the things about about genres. Um, he'll he'll eventually go on to say that we understand different kinds of genres through the tropes that are used in them. Mm. So 
history brings certain kinds of expectations to it. So for example, uh, history is usually, um, uh, in a classical sense, told in chronological order, right? That's one of the things we expect of it. But that's not necessarily true of a novel. So what are the other things that make history and a novel different genres? What tropes are allowed and disallowed into each one that make them contribute to genres that we recognize as being definitely history, definitely a novel, definitely an epic poem? Do you want to talk about prefiguration? Uh, as he, he does, he talks without defining. Uh, and I could, I wanted to make sure I, my understanding is, you know, kind of matches with yours. Uh, and P Piaget helps me understand what he means by prefiguration. So with the, with the help of um, Piaget, let's say a child is able to play a telephone. And so he's able to pick a toy telephone and uh, just pretend that he's talking to the toy telephone. A second stage, a next stage of in, in child development enables the child to now pick a fruit like a banana and pretend that it's a telephone. That's a stage of representation. You're like imagining something to be something else, mm -hmm. uh, applying the metaphor of a telephone to this banana. So he says that this act of pretending already prefigures in the use of the telephone. The use of the telephone, the activity of going back and forth, the physical movements, they all prefigure that next step of now using it a little bit more intentionally, a little bit more reflectively to then apply to the, uh, to the banana. Mm -hmm. so this prefiguration is that the material uh, for discourse is already present in the previous stage. And what we do with tropes, what they do is that they bring in a new application to the material that already prefigures the, the ability for the trope, something like that. Yeah, I knew you would get more out of the Piaget section than I did. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was one of the parts that for me was, um, you know, I, of course, I, from, I mean, I, I read it two or three times and I'm familiar with the stages and everything. Well, somewhat familiar with the stages. I mean, I had Psych 101 and everything, <laughs> uh, but his, his application to them, uh, to the stages seemed like I might need to be more familiar with them than I was. Uh, it, the, the thing about, um, he talks about Freud, right? Mm -hmm. the, the most obvious to see the, the, his examples sometimes are like needlessly abstruse. Uh, the Freud, he should have talked about the id, the ego and the superego. Mm -hmm. I mean, what better way to talk about a trope mm -hmm. that everyone will recognize uh, than those. But he talks about some, I don't know what, what he, he did. He didn't even mention those, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he, yeah. He, fo he focused more on the process uh, that Freud identified. So he. And, he oh, in, yeah. in, in dream yeah. interpretation. Dream yeah, interpretation. yeah. Which is very striking that he, well, basically his claim is that that process between what we see in our dream, the, the apparent dream material, and what is beneath them. The translation between that is also uh, tro uh, tropical. Uh, is it something akin to discourse that the gets us to the manifest? Right, yeah. right. It gets us from the, the latent level to the manifest level. So that kind of like charged his idea of discourse, his ideas of tropes. Every time he added somebody else's idea to them, it kind of like thickened or enriched the value. He charged it with extra value, his uh, tropes and his discourse idea. Uh, there, there is, um, and he alludes to it at the, the very end of the essay, how he's been accused of um, basically being some sort of, you know, fancy pants postmodernist, right? Mm -hmm. Saying that facts don't exist. You know, there's no, there's no reason to say that we can have access to history or historical knowledge. Um, uh, how do you how would you, how do you think he would counter something like that? Hmm. Be, because he does say, you know, in my next 12 essays, I do my, you know, I trust that I have defended myself from that accusation. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and I think he defends himself enough in the in the introduction. Um, how how do you think? And if you, if you don't have an answer, I'll, I'll give you my answer. If you mm. don't have anything to say about that, if a couple of times, and when he talks about other people, he says, "Hey, I don't." Somebody might might say that he just imposed his theoretical system on the data, and maybe so. Maybe it's half theoretical imposition, half uh, determined by uh, by data. But that's not really his his question. I think my impression is that he he's concerned with something else, uh, but I don't know how he would respond specifically to anti-realism. Uh, to um, there was a quote in here. Oh yeah, I, I, th I think you. Yeah, it's it's the very beginning again. Hmm. Like everything important, he says. Mm -hmm. um, he's talking about that slipping away slipping towards human consciousness, right? Um, our discourse always tends to slip away from our data towards the structures of human co consciousness with which we are trying to grasp them. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to explain what I meant by Kantian earlier, and that might give some insight as to what his defense would be from that accusation. So just like a three minute Kant refresher, for those people who may not be familiar with Kant's big um, contribution to philosophy at the end of the 18th century, Kant is trying to mediate between two large philosophical traditions that preceded him, uh, those of the empiricists and those of the rationalists. The rationalists say that the mind itself can conclude everything that we need to know about the world. Uh, and empiricists say that uh, the mind uh, itself knows nothing, and that we need not uh, we need experience. Our our minds need to be written on by the world uh, in order to have knowledge of it. And of course, the classic formulation of that would be John Locke's Tabula Rasa, right? The blank slate. Our mind is a blank slate. We know almost certain, uh, it, at least as far as language acquisition, now that that is simply not the case, but. Uh, that's a much later discovery. Kant comes along and says <laughs> that there's something inherent in our minds that when we look out into the world, we don't, we don't have direct access to the things that we perceive. Um, and he, he makes this distinction. Uh, he calls raw factual data out there, quote unquote, inverted quotes. He calls them noumena, N-O-U-M-E-N-A. Once we experience them, once they've been processed by our cognitive faculties, they have been transformed into phenomena. So he has this distinction between noumena and phenomena. Our, our minds are not these just sort of blank, receptive, bland interpreters of the world. They actively impose things on the world. Like, for example, Kant will say, when we look out in the world, there is no such thing, and Hume was famous for saying this, making this criticism, There's, we can't tell cause from effect. I mean, you see two bowling balls, one hits the other and the other one starts to move. Where is the cause and where is the effect? You can't pinpoint them in time you just have to say, well, I guess when this one hits this one, this one starts moving. That's something our, Kant will say, that's something our brain is imposing on the world. Other things our mind imposes on the world are time and space mm -hmm. and a lot of other things too. But basically our mind is an active participant in our understanding of the world. And I think where, uh, where Hayden White's Kantianism comes in is that... <clears throat> our deployment and use of tropes is the way that our mind understands and relates to discourse. It's the way that we try to understand things. So it's, um, the domains are a little bit different. Kant's talking about all of sensory experience and he's talking about um, human conversations, human discourse. But still, um, you know, when, when we take those you know raw facts of history or say for example uh, we don't have access to those but what we do have access to is 
uh, our way of relating to them uh, through a number of ways and through organizing them uh, with principles that we recognize as principles of history writing. Mm -hmm. Just to pick a genre. It doesn't have to be history. It could be a novel or whatever I said, um, you know, any, any, any genre. But that our mind imposes imposes those things. It uses tropes to understand. And I think if we can sort of see both as, as a mapping of one, one to the other, Kant, you, you have this sort of um, intangible uh, uh, noumena that, that we, we can't experience. The only thing we can experience is what our brain has processed and what has already become phenomena. Mm -hmm. And Hayden White will say, we don't have access to those raw facts. All we have is access to those processed facts, those discourse mediated facts. mediated facts. And how are they mediated? They're mediated through tropes. There you go. I think that is the essence of the introduction. Right, right. It's, uh, let me just add a little bit of a paraphrase. Uh, it, it, I find it useful to talk about that historical movement from Empiric rationalism, empiricism, and, and Kant through the, so the sources of error that they identified. So for a rationalist, the major source of error for us is perceptual illusions, like the senses uh, deceive us. And for empiricists, this major source of error is our prejudice, are the ideas that don't have any correspondence to experience. Mm -hmm. And then with Kant, we identify a new source of error, which is not just uh, an idea that doesn't correspond to experience or an experience that is uh, illusory, but a misidentification of something as something else, a category that is a part of our, the structure of our consciousness, but then we project it as something in the world. Mm -hmm. The mishandling of our, Yeah. So we, yes. the noumena is that place, placeholder where we shouldn't identify our phenomena as more than what they are. We shouldn't let them speak, uh, speak on behalf of the noumena <laughs> too much. Yes. Yeah, because we don't even have access to them. Right. All right. So maybe we can read that last paragraph, just last few sentences of the introduction, where he takes an anti, takes an anti-realist, and not oh, re like, rejects the anti-realism. Let, let, let me add one more thing. Um, sure. So I, I, I did that whole thing about Kant just to sort of recapitulate oh. why he thinks that he might have a defense of that accusation about there's no such you know, thing as access to truth. What he's really saying is, and I think he says it right where you said at the end, I'll read it. Mm -hmm. I trust that the bulk of these essays will relieve me of those charges, the charges I, I just mentioned, at least in part. I have never denied that knowledge of history, culture, and society was possible. I have only denied that a scientific knowledge of the sort actually attained in the study of physical nature was possible. But I have tried to show that even if we can't achieve a properly scientific knowledge of human nature, we can achieve another kind of knowledge about it. The kind of knowledge which literature and art in general give us in easily recognizable examples. Mm -hmm. Only a willful tyrannical intelligence could believe that the only kind of knowledge we can aspire to is that represented by the physical sciences. My aim here has been to show that we do not have to choose between art and science, that we cannot do so in practice. Not only that we don't have to, but that we can't do it. If we hope to continue to speak about culture as against nature and moreover, speak about it in ways that are possible to all in various dimensions of our specifically human being. Yeah, that great. is great. I, I wish he wrote the whole book that way. Mm. He knows how to open an essay. He knows how to finish off an essay. Yeah. <laughs> it's the middle part maybe we need to work on. It's, it's that middle 20 pages. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he, he really finished strong. I love that. I love that part about the willful tyrannical intelligence that yes. he wants all sciences to be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how he, how he uh, italicizes human being. Mm -hmm. I thought mm -hmm. that was a, a lovely poetic touch mm -hmm. too. He also returns to the idea of uh, kind of hints at a, a prefiguration. I wanted to mention that he, for him, 
uh, rationality or our capacity for rationality and logic already prefigures in our so-called non-rational capacities. That's mm -hmm. why the, the two are not opposite forces, that we, our rationality is opposite or has to overcome and eliminate our uh, pre-rational or non-rational ra sides because they, they emerge out of them. Up. Right, exactly. Yes. All right, I think that's good. Anything okay. else? Yeah. No, I, I think we covered everything pretty clearly. We should yeah. wrap this up. We'll, we'll post this on both of our channels. Yeah. Sounds good. And, and, the um, ne and next discussion will be to which everybody's invited if they're interested in uh, the burden of history. Yes, the burden of history, the first formal essay. Um, I don't know whether I'll be able to do it next week. It might be the week after. Sounds good. Um, I'm a bit busy, but no more than two weeks from okay. today. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks John. for doing it, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.